All right, fantastic, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Red Burden, Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at Compass Family Services. And so excited to welcome all of you here to our Inclusion Talk Series, featuring our special guest uh, presenter, Dr. John Paul. With over 15 years of experience in leadership and social justice education, Dr. John Paul is focused on using their voice and platform to highlight the joy and resilience of marginalized people. Dr. Higgins is an award-winning educator, professor, national speaker, freelance journalist, thought leader, and media critic who examines the intersections of identity, gender, and race in entertainment. Named National Black Justice Coalition's inaugural Emerging Leaders to Watch and Business Equality Magazine's Top 40 LGBTQ People Under 40, their work has been featured on sites such as Essence, Ebony, Complex, MTV News, Out Magazine, BET, and Paper Magazine. A culture strike in 2021 disruptor and Twitter spaces spark creator, Dr. Higgins is a trailblazer who is creating, sharing, and crafting the stories their ancestors did not get to tell. Dr. Paul has held positions at both Chairman Entertainment and Edith Productions and consulted with brands including United Artists, Amazon, and other top media leaders. They have worked on inclusion projects with leaders in entertainment, including Fox, the NFL, Apple, Disney, Instagram, BuzzFeed, and Glad. They have also been a features feature on South by Southwest and TEDx and competed on the season, the last season of Netflix's Nailed It. They are the creator, executive producer, and host of the Black Fat Film Podcast, which was developed via iHeartMedia's Next Up initiative in 2021. The podcast has gone on to be named one of the top Black podcasts to listen to by Essence Magazine. Dr. Paul holds a doctorate in educational justice from the University of the Redlands and regularly writes in lectures on what liberation means for Black queer, fat, and non-binary people. With all of that said, Dr. Paul, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was not expecting you to read that one per se, <laughs> but all that to be said, thank you everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm very grateful that I've been able to be in all of these spaces to make sure that folks who look and live like us are fairly represented. Um, so today we're gonna get into a conversation talking um, specifically about what is, you know, we're, we're in LGBTQ History Month. We're wanting to talk a little bit about what does it look like, you know, past, present, and future. And so I have this presentation that I've put together. And what I want to, I, like, I kind of want to start off doing is lay out, uh, you know, foundational kind of pieces as we talk today. Um, if there are questions, I always tell people, please put your questions in the chat box. I will not be able to see them, but I definitely will make sure that I answer them. Um, if you have a question that you just feel like, okay, I, I wanna ask Dr. Higgins this, but I don't wanna ask it in the group, feel free to send me a private chat. I, I definitely will respond to it and we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk through that. So I'm gonna share my screen with the presentation and we'll jump right in that. So, this conversation of celebrating LGBTQ history, um, I am a, 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 a proponent of we cannot talk about where we are going if we don't know where we've been. And we have been through a lot. And when I say we, I say this in the sense of everybody, especially queer Black people, we have been through a lot. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to kind of start with today is that I wanted to go past surface level conversations, right? It's really easy for us to get into what happened at Stonewall or what happened here or what happened there. Um, but no one ever really talks about kind of what or the what the why is around that thing happening in history, right? And how that's going to shape the, 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 the places we are in today and really thinking about where we are going. So I wanted to kind of move past that. And then what I also wanted to do is I wanted to acknowledge that a lot of what we're going to be talking about are oppressive systems that are present. They are oppressive systems that continue to maintain. Um, and I like to ask people as they're listening today, as they're thinking about their own 
positions in the work, quote unquote, right? Whether it be if they're in community with LGBTQ people, they're in community with Black LGBTQ people, Latinx LGBTQ people, right? There is a position of power that we have in being in those positions. And so thinking about your own privilege, thinking about the ways that you do your work and thinking about the ways that you can advocate for those who may have been lost in this history, right? Some of the folks who may not be seen or the folks who may not feel like they're valued. Um, and then really thinking about this notion about being out. I know we spend a lot of time, especially in like Pride Month, we're talking LGBTQ History Month, we're talking about what it means to be out. But very rarely do we talk about the people who have ba basically been pushed out, right? The folks who didn't get a choice in, 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 in being who they are, that they've been pulled basically out of the closet um, and had to utilize a lot of that in their his in the work that they've done throughout history to maintain that for folks who are coming out, that they can come out in safety and feel as if they have what they need in order to thrive. And so I wanted to make sure that we, we notate that as we're talking throughout the day. Okay, um, so a quick history, right? Um, I know some folks will ask, what is the difference between Pride Month and what is the difference between LGBTQ History Month? Well, the difference in, in Pride Month is Pride Month really focuses on slash, it has it spends a lot of time celebrating kind of a lot of the strikes that were made right around the time of Stonewall, right? This notion that there were a lot of folks that were marching the parades, all of the things in relation to equality, but the history month is where we're actually celebrating those who are really truly in the fight for equality for LGBTQ people. And so this started in 1994. It really started with National Coming Out Day, which we all know is October 11th. And being that that was already instituted in 1979, folks started saying, okay, well, we have our pride parades, we're starting to get equality, we're starting to have all of the rights and the things that we want, but how are we actually making sure that we're not forgetting the people who are doing the work? Um, when we're talking about individuals, there are specific names that I have chosen, and I'll talk to you all about why I picked those in particular people um, as we get in more into the presentation, but for that matter, I just wanted to make sure that I can separate what the difference is, because I get this question a lot. What's the difference between June and October? June is about the celebration, the, 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 the ways that we've been able to make the strides, been able to kind of keep things going. Um, but it's uh, this month is specifically recognizing the folks who really stuck their necks out to make sure that LGBTQ people, Black LGBTQ people um, are recognized for the ways that they continue to be trailblazers. So I just wanted to make sure that I make that clear. Okay. All right, so as we go into the next slide, um, the one thing that I've wanted to really kind of talk through or really talk about as we're talking about history is that while we celebrate the history, right, we, we want to make sure that we're not forgetting people. And so I intentionally, um, I know that there have been conversations around Harvey Milk. I know that there have been conversations about other individuals. Like I said, I know it'd be real easy for me to lean into Marsha P. Johnson, right? It's not to say that their work is not valuable. But I am specifically in the mind of, and the work that I do is always trying to highlight the names of folks that maybe we we either have seen their name or we've heard of their name, but we've really never engaged their name and how their name specifically in the work that they've done really set the precedence for us to be in this place where we can talk about our present, if that's okay with folks. Um, and so really wanting to note that, right, there are a lot of individuals who have, I would say almost sometimes intentionally have been left out of the conversation wanted to bring those names up before I get into kind of where we are presently and where we're going in the future. Um, so first, um, if anybody, does anyone know the name of this individual? It's on the picture, but it is, no, nobody? Okay, good. I'm glad that if we, we don't know who this person is. Um, <laughs> and again, I did this intentionally. Um, Polly Murray. So when you hear the name Polly Murray, this is a name that not everyone seems to know, um, but they were one of the first people who purported to speak very openly about gender identity and race. Um, and a lot of folks like to believe that uh, it was Rosa Parks who opted to not give up her seat on the bus in that boycott in the early 50s, but it was actually Polly Murray who gave um, Rosa Parks the kind of laid the platform to say, this is how you do rights in terms of the the boy the bus boycotts. Um, it was 15 years prior to Rosa Park that this actually happened. Um, and so with that being said, Polly Murray was on the bus with their partner at the time. They were asked to be uh, to move to a broken seat in the back and Polly said, I am not moving. Um, this is not something that I'm going to do. Um, and initially was arrested for that and, and released, but all that to be said was very instrumental in a lot of the bus boycott work that was being done up to the point where Rosa got the notoriety 
The thing that I often like to throw out um, that a lot of folks don't know about Polly Murray is that there was a lot of segregation that was happening up in North Carolina. And Polly was actually very instrumental in making sure that that uh, segregation was being amplified and was doing work to, not, uh, to make sure that it, that, it, that it didn't happen, but also in part to that too. Um, a lot of it was through the lens of utilizing religion and religious philosophies that they were able to do a lot of the work that they did. And so when you start thinking about folks who are queer and also live at the intersection of religion and, and things of that nature, Polly Murray was one of the individuals who really helped make that happen. And so as I've been thinking about my own journey and thinking about kind of how I live my own life, um, there are some facets from Polly Murray that I have implemented into my own life that really has helped me kind of find myself in this fight and in the work that I do. So next, um, I'm not going to even question you all. We all know that this is Bayard Rustin, um, but I intentionally added Bayard Rustin because um, as like I like I was sharing, I did get a chance to see Rustin. Um, it actually is supposed to come out next month on Netflix. Um, one of the things that I think is very instrumental in, in Rustin's journey here, let me make sure that I get rid of this, um, in Rustin's journey was that a lot of what we saw during the March on Washington was actually planned by Bayard. And that's what most of the movie is about. It's about the ways that they removed Bayard's name from a lot of the work that MLK was doing. Um, and there was a big why. A lot of individuals asked the question, well, why? Why is it that you know people were afraid to give Bayard Rustin their due justice while they were alive? And a lot of it had to do with him being a Black queer man. Um, and a couple of years before that, he had had some issues and run-ins with the law because of him being a queer man who was out and was living, in my opinion, his best life. Um, and had run into some issues around that. And so when I learned about Bayard Rustin, specifically I learned about Bayard Rustin and I did an actual whole research project for him in my doctor in my master's level course at Redlands, um, there were just so many things that I really loved about Bayard and I actually dedicated my dissertation to Bayard in the idea of the vein of for people who oftentimes are not celebrated in the work that they're doing. Um, a lot of the forgotten individuals, him being one of those people. Um, he is one of the reasons why we have the I Have a Dream speech. I don't know what specific parts he wrote, but it is it has been found that he was actually one of the individuals who coined a lot of the things that uh, MLK was very famous for, or Dr. King was famous for in the speech. And then other things that a lot of folks don't know is that in 1964, he directed a one-day student boycott at the New York Public Schools um, association to protest this racial imbalance in the system. And so that was one of the things that I really loved about Bayer was that he was very open about his identity as a queer Black man, but also on top of that, he was also very open about the racial imbalances that were happening in the educational system, much kind of like the work that I do today. Um, and he was also very heavily involved in the gay rights movement. And I would I, I would behoove and say I'd be removed to say that a lot of what Marsha P and a lot of what Sylvia Rivera had in their work um, came from the practices that Bayer and a lot of the folks in the Black rights movement um, utilized in order to make change and to make progressions. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are in San Francisco, does the street look familiar? Some head nods? Anybody know where this is? Says Taylor? No? Okay. Well, with that Compton. being said, yes, the Compton, Compton cafeteria. cafeteria. Yes, thank you. So I wanted to make sure that I highlight that as well. Um, but often talking about the women who were a part of that, there were four specific trans women um, who utilized this coin and ate a party, it's a time to act up. And so um, I would say before Stonewall, it was the Compton cafeteria riots that really helped lead this notion of what needed to happen, right? The change, the policing, uh, the hatred that was being kind of pushed against the LGBTQ community at that point in time. Um, this, these, these women, I would say there's, there's multiple women. Um, I don't want to take away from anybody who was a part of this movement in saying that, that many of these women were just in a place where they were basically fed up. And I would say, I would, I, I probably would be renounced to say that many of us are probably in that space. We're kind of tired of what we've been seeing. Um, we're kind of probably in a place where we're wanting to figure out what do we do and how do we, how do we, how are we working collaboratively? collaboratively to make sure that we are upholding their names, but also doing the work. And that's what we're going to get into when we talk about the present, where we are, and, and why it's so important for us to be having these conversations. But I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that you all sit on history. Um, and many of you may not know that, that you sit around or you sit in spaces of history and that a lot of the work that you are doing is informed by the work that has already been done in your community. So I just wanted to name that. All right. So now we're kind of here, right? 
Um, for those of you who may know, for those of you who do not know, these two women are women who are women of color, but they're also outwardly queer to have one of them working in office and then also to have one of them working for the state of California. I know Corrine Jean-Pierre works for, uh, for, for Biden's administration. And then LaFora Butler just took on the role for, uh, for uh, the role that was vacated here in California. Um, this is this is phenomenal because we're seeing two women who are walking in their authentic truth, but they're also telling folks that at the same time that they can be who they are and still get things done. But it's imperative for me to stop it and, and pause because there has been a lot that has led up to these two things, right? And so we we, we want to celebrate it, but at the same time. I think it's important for us to kind of talk about where we've been and where we are now and why these moments are so important for us to think about the work that we're doing and how do we pr proceed knowing that we now have these two women who really, in my opinion, are carrying a lot of weight on their shoulders in relation to the history that has been that has impacted specifically the Black LGBTQ community. So the question, how does their work and their legacy tie into what's going on now? I know that that's probably what you all are here for. You're wondering, what does the history mean for now? And what does this mean for me? Well, first, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to kind of talk about in relation to all of this is that there's a lot of stuff that, you know, that we are being faced with. And I tried to make sure that this information was as, as, as accurate as possible. I have friends who work over at the um, ACLU, and so this is coming from them. Um, there could be more out there, but I will say that this is what's most current, right? We have over 520 anti-LGBTQ uh, bills that are being introduced in the state at the state level. Um, 220 are bills specifically targeting transgender and non-binary people. And for some of you who are probably wondering, you know, well, where do you have the space to talk about this? I actually work for an organization that is helping to protect uh, queer kids in our community. I work for Rainbow Pride Youth Alliance um, on outside of all of the other things that I'm doing. And I've been having to show up to a lot of meetings and having to do a lot of press around a lot of the policies that are impacting our youth currently down here in Southern California. For many of you who don't know, there are policies that are going into different um, spaces and places within K through 12 that are basically saying that children don't have the rights uh, to change their names or to change the ways that they are addressed in, in the classroom. Um, and so far, I think it's seven, eight, I think as of yesterday, there were eight different school districts that are trying to introduce this policy. So again, a lot of stuff is happening right now, right? Um, at least 19 reported depth of trans and gender non-conforming people, that information comes over from us um, I think that actually came from GLAAD and then the anti-queer and trans propaganda that we're seeing. Um, I know as of recently, I think it was, um, not Barstow, what school district was it? Um, I think it's actually Temecula. Temecula actually just put into law that there are no queer or trans flags that are allowed in the schools, right? Um, so again, we're up against a lot of stuff at the current moment. And I would say that I would think that the folks in history probably felt the same way that we felt now, right? This notion of is it or how is it going to get better and what do we do? And so I kind of wanted to come in as a beacon of light and saying that as we're looking at all of this stuff, we do see that there are some wins that we have gotten in the present, right? Um, there are five countries that have decriminalized uh, consensual same-sex relationships, specifically Antigua and Barbados. Um, but also, too, we have different places like Spain, and then we even have our own government that is stepping out in proclamation to say that they support LGBTQ people. Um, and to know that Gavin Newsom is actually introducing legislation here in the present to try to protect and try to work with or to make sure that LGBTQ people um, are protected. But I know that with all of that to be said, the common question that I get from people is, what does this mean for our future? Um, as we process all of the stuff that's happening in the present, it's not to say that it's not heavy. I think the one thing that I really want folks to hear before we kind of jump into this notion of what does this mean for the future is that, you know, and I had to process this with my therapist before I actually came in, right? Um, we are we are lights, we are beacons of lights for so many people who often sit in the dark. And I think just by being your authentic self, by you showing up, by you constantly making the conscious decision to wake up every day knowing what you've been through, knowing where you stand, knowing where you, what you're currently, what you see in the world. And there's a lot. It's to say that outside of even just being LGBTQ, to see all of the stuff that's happening globally, to see the stuff that's happening nationally, see the stuff that's happening in my own backyard. Some days you can wake up and feel like, wow, this is just too much. I don't, I, you know, how do I, how am I making a difference or how am I adding to a better world? Um, there are many people who are looking at you as the beacon of light for them. 
Um, and so this is just my way of saying, you know, as we're thinking about where we are in the present, it is imperative for us to not forget that there have been individuals, specifically Audre Lord, James Baldwin. Um, I, I tend to do in a lot of my talks and um, before I get into like doing DEI work, I always kind of acknowledge that they are the ancestors. They are the ones who laid the foundation for us to keep going and, and, and are telling us with their words um, that they've left behind, that we are we are capable and that we are going to be the ones to make a difference in this world. And so that's the thing I really wanted to kind of sit with for the future, because I think that that's what a lot of individuals are struggling with at this time. They're saying, I see all of this stuff happening. What does it mean for my future? And so that is what I'm hoping that I can read with you all today is a little glimmer of hope of what the future will look like. Um, and so one of the things that I always like to tell people is that regardless of how people feel about it, the future is queer. <laughs> the future is queer and the future is going to continue to be more queer. And what I mean by that is saying that we have to be bolder in the ways that we move, right? So sometimes, you know, you can sit with this notion of, am I going to cause trouble or am I going to create problems by acknowledging a problem? And the reality is, yes. You have to be that person that has to shake things up a little bit, whether it be in your organization, whether it be in your community, whether it be in your own personal relationships. You know, I had to have real tough conversations with my parents when I told them that I came out as non-binary and I wanted them to use my pronouns the correct way, right? Sometimes you having to be bolder is the move because someone needs you to be bolder for them. Um, also recognizing too that silence and complicity is not something that's going to protect us. And I think that's one of the things that I, I, I try to impart in a lot of the work that I do, whether it be on the air or whether it be in a speaking situation like this or whether it even be in the classroom, I have to let people know, you know, one of the things that somebody told me years ago that has stuck with me as I've done my work is if they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the night. And I have to tell people this all of the time. A lot of the stuff that folks are doing is because folks are too afraid to speak up and say, hey, this is not right or this is wrong or we need to change this in order to make it more equitable or to make it more inclusive for folks, right? And so recognizing that silence can oftentimes be deafening. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of that silence comes from fear and there's power in fear, right? And so there's so much power that folks tend to control when they recognize that you're not going to speak up. And I think a big part of the future for us, right, we looked at our history, we've seen that when folks started to speak up and say, this is an injustice or this is a problem and it needs to be fixed. That is how we've gotten to this place that we can continue to keep moving and doing what we do and the work that we do. Um, and then also recognizing one of the things, you know, I, I, this is this is when I wrote this, this was the thing that I said, if no one takes anything from this presentation, this is the one thing that I hope that folks fully get, that there is such a luxury to be unbothered by what is happening around us. Right. There's a luxury to being able to say that that's their problem or that's, you know, what, what trans women are dealing with has nothing to do with me. Right. Um, I always tell people that at the end of the day, because I am non-binary and because I do have such a very close tie to the trans community, um, I always like to tell people that my number one goal every day when I wake up is to make sure that trans people are more free than they were the day before. And that is something that I've committed myself to. And it's not to say that that's something you have to commit yourself to, right? But this notion of me knowing that there's a problem in the trans community, me knowing that there's a problem in the Black trans community requires me to wake up every single day and say, I have to do something to make sure that they're more free tomorrow, right? And so this notion of being unbothered, this being able to say, oh, I don't have to worry about that. That is a privilege, that is a luxury that many people do not have. And so I wanted to make sure that I named that and thinking about the future. What are the things that you're wanting to commit yourself to? And again, you don't have to tell me in this presentation, you don't have to put it in the chat, but I definitely want folks walking away from this presentation and saying, okay, there were folks in history who put themselves on the line to make sure other people were more free. What am I willing to step up to do to make sure that people who, are, who could be technically more oppressed than me um, have the freedoms that oftentimes they feel like they may not. Um, obviously, I have a have a my whole my whole degree my whole thing. I've ever since I've been in school, it's always been about media. Um, and so I always say, you never not going to get some media from me when we talk about these kind of conversations. Um, I always like to say media often informs the way we think about ourselves and the ways that we think about our community. Um, and so I always tell people too that media is inherently going to be more queer, right? Um, this notion that we need more queer storytelling. Um, I always tell people, if you're thinking about starting a podcast and you go, well, it's not on a big network, start it anyway. Queer people need to hear other queer people's voices. Queer people need to hear other people's stories. 
people need to know that other queer people are out there doing the work or creating community or whatever the case may be, knowing that we can thrive and that we can be. Um, so being more in tune with the media that not only you engage, but also the, the media that you are putting out. Um, if you have a story to tell, somebody out there needs to see it and someone needs to hear it. Funny story, I always tell people, you know, when I got asked to do Nailed It back in 2020, I thought it was so silly. I thought it was ridiculous. I was like, I'm not going to do that. That's silly. Why would I do that? Right. And then someone was saying, you know, one of the things that I had a conversation with my manager about, someone was saying, you have no idea who is going to need to see you on that show. I kid you not, being on Nailed It, I've had so many parents reach out to me and say, my queer son, my queer daughter, my non-binary child really enjoyed you on that show. And so even for me to just do something so simple as nailed it, it turned, it, in a way it turned around and it told other queer youth that they could be living their authentic selves in life with me just doing something as simple as that 30 minute show. So again, folks need to be able to see you and also hear you as well. Um, the other thought that I have is using your stories and your experience to shape the narrative for folks who are looking for it in the media. You know, I am currently in the process of trying to sell a book. And one of the things or one of the tenets in my book that I'm talking about is how I found myself through media. I grew up in a very, 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 very closed, <laughs> closed off home. And one of the things that I often turned to when I was growing up was Will and Grace, was Queer as Folk, was uh, Noah's Ark. I was looking for myself in a lot of visual places because at the end of the day, I didn't have queer people around me. Um, and so that is one of the things that I think is imperative for us to look at too, is that sometimes people are looking for themselves through these medias because they oftentimes don't have the community. Um, I, it, would, I be, it would be beyond me not to promote my show in the process of this too, because I all think you all should be listening, not only just because I think it's a fantastic show, but we have some, some guests on the show. This week, Francesca Ramsey's on the show and the jams that she dropped on the show when I was listening back. I was moved by it, right? Hearing another Black queer woman talk about their own journey um, throughout media, it, it just, it blows my mind, right? So um, I would say that, but even thinking about Legendary and thinking about P-Valley and, and things of that nature, right? Being able to actually see trans representation throughout many of these shows, has, it's just absolutely been stunning for me. And so I wanted to also name that too, that we have a lot of trans people on the show. We had T.S. Madison on earlier this year, um, and that has, ultimately open a door for me to be able to be closer to her to be able to better understand what's going on in the world so that way I can do my best to advocate for that as well. Um, and so with that being said, I wanted to make sure that I left time um, for folks to ask questions for us to get into conversation because I didn't want you feeling like I was lecturing you the whole hour that we were together. Um, but one of the, the, the pieces or I would say one of the, the, the things that has really held me. Um, I'm a very much a quote person. Everywhere in my house or somewhere in my home, I have a quote <laughs> somewhere out. This, one, this is one of the quotes that has really held me in the last few years. Um, it says, we are powerful because we have survived. And that is what it is about, survival and growth. And so when we talk about where we've been, where we've talked about, you know, where, where, we're, where we are currently, where we are, um, where we are going. I think survival is definitely a, an important piece, but I think it is imperative for us to think about how do we help other people not only to survive, but thrive. And that is something that I'm trying to show in the tenets of all of the things that I'm doing, um, that there is elements for us, right? Even with all of the stuff that we're contending with, all of the things, whether it be family not accepting us, people moving out of our lives because we're becoming more authentic with what we say and how we move, um, there's still this element of you are thriving and who you were meant to be. And so that is the purpose of this conversation. When we ask where we're, where have we been, where are we now, where we are going, we are moving towards a place where we're not just surviving, but how much more powerful we are in community as we thrive together um, and push through a lot of the terrible things that we see. So um, that's kind of the presentation that I have. Um, I always like to say, if you want to engage me on social media, feel free to do so. I see that there's a lot of chatter in the chat. So I'm going to go through the chat. And then if anyone wants to ask me any questions, or if we want to get into conversation, I would love to do that as well. Um, how do you feel about that, Red? Is that okay? Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, absolutely love the presentation, Dr. Paul. And yes, there have been things going back and forth in the chat. A lot of people 
really just highlighting some of the things that you said. But what I want to do, because as we have time, and I'm so glad that we were able to leave some time for the Q&A, because I know you enjoy engaging with folks. I'm so glad yes, that you got to promote your podcast. Um, so I hope everyone <laughs> listens. Is while we're here, uh, normally we don't have as much time with some of our speakers, and, and Dr. Paul is an educator um, and brilliant in so many ways. If you have a question, you can either put it in the chat, or if you want to come off mute and engage with Dr. Paul, you absolutely can do so. Uh, so please, I know this group is not shy. I'm sure that you have questions. So I'm going to be checking the chat and then we will highlight any of the questions that you all have. But if you want to come off mute, if you want to ask Dr. Paul a question, now is the time. So please feel free to do so. And I intentionally do this because I go to a lot of presentations where they will throw out a whole bunch of information or a whole bunch of thoughts and then no one gets a chance to ask any questions. And I'm just like, what are we supposed to do <laughs> with all this information that we, we, we took in or all of these thoughts that we took in? And so that's why I wanted to make sure that we had at least 15 to 20 minutes to be able to chat so that way we could process. Because um, I feel like that's what people really need now more than anything, than someone lecturing them. So. Absolutely. Also, for everyone here, you'll see that I put in the link, whether you work at Compass Family Services or you don't, is a, a post-event survey where we are going to work with our amazing uh, impact and learning team. And we're going to send Dr. Paul all the data that you share, the good, the bad, all the comments. We want to make sure that he has everything or they have everything that they need as they continue doing this amazing work. And Dr. Paul, I guess I want to start off with you. And this is more of an academic-based question because I know you are an educator. Sure. And I know that... Mm -hmm. Uh, the work that you've done on your PhD around Rustin is what are your feelings around some of the, some of the, what I would call are, are really character assassination pieces where people talk about whether it was Bayard's ties to the community or the Communist Party, whether it is was Bayard a CIA informant, and how do you help people have the nuanced conversations of what may or may not be true, especially we have to be very mindful of the FBI and the CIA and COINTELPRO. How do you make room for nuance where it seems as though people want to diminish what was done by trying to find ways that anybody is not perfect. How, how do you address things like yeah. that? Well, I think the word perfect is, is that, right? So I think the word perfect in itself is very much tied to white supremacy. And I think anybody who is a person of color, anyone who's marginalized when they're doing what I like to think of as they're causing good trouble, they're going to be critiqued. Folks are going to try to poke holes in the work, right? Um, I will tell, I will say this very outrightly. And this is, again, this is the reason why I love talking because I can only share so much of myself in a presentation. Um, I have, I wouldn't say I've had people come after my character, but I've had people say, well, John, you're not a real activist because you're not marching, right? You're not out here, you know, you're not out here with a blowhorn. You're not out here, you know, in community with people. You spend all your time online writing and you spend all of your time in, in boardrooms with people and things of that nature. So you're not a real activist. And I'm going, we all have a responsibility to do something in, in whatever capacity. And I have to tell people, you don't know my, you don't know what's going on with my knees that day. You don't know what's going on with my back. I have a bad back. Like, Walking three to four miles, it's hard for me, right? So, so you you don't you never know. But my activism, the way I choose to do my activism is the way I choose. And it is not my job to critique someone else's way of trying to get us all free. What my work is, what my work is and what my work will always be is tied to liberation. If I can walk into a room and tell that exec that what you're doing and what and how you've interacted with that trans person is problematic and we need to change that. That's liberation, right? I'm making sure that other trans people in that space is, is, is a bit safer. And I like to always say too, like safety, safety is, is, is real tricky because no one's ever really safe, right? You have black people who've been at home and have been murdered <laughs> for just being at home. So safety is very, very tricky. But when we go back to this notion of, 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 of people trying to assassinate Bayard's character, of course they are, right? Of course they're going to look at what Bayard is doing, regardless of what they might have been doing at the time and say, oh, there's a problem there, there's a problem there, because that is what white supremacy does. That is what the system of oppression wants to do. It wants to make you the enemy when you're trying to resolve a larger issue. So 
I'm not going to be, I, I mean, I'm not going to come in here and say Bayard was 100% good in what he did. And, you know, that was what he did was wrong. Or he did, no, I, I, Bayard was another human being, just like me trying to figure out how do I make it in a world that does not want me here? Right. And that is really what this conversation is about. Right. I can provide you a presentation to show you kind of all of the ways since the early 40s. Right. People have pushed for liberation. I can talk to you about what is going on. But the truth of the matter and the conversation that we're having today is that people do not want us here. Period. Right. And so that is what that that survival, that is what that thriving piece is. And I think that's the thing that trips a lot of people up when they look at Dr. John Paul. Right. So I tell people 2017, I'm publicly fired from a job and people think, ha, we got you. Right. We finally got you out of academia. And I go, well, I'll just go right around you and I'll keep doing the work somewhere else. And that's what I've been maintaining to do. People seem to always forget that. I'm not, for me, the word is relentless. I am going to relentlessly spend my life trying to help other people see that it is possible to thrive, but also that it is possible for us to be who we are. And, that, 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 and, and that's what Bayard set the precedence to do. Bayard said, you have the right to live. You have the right to thrive. That is what I'm following. So, you know, their political affiliations and all that aside, hey, we all have things, right? I like to watch Family Guy. You can critique me for that. Right. But at the end of the day, I'm still out here pushing for trans liberation, for black liberation, for black trans liberation. So I, I absolutely love that. And that is some of the passion that you all will hear when you listen to the podcast, Black Fat Bill, because <laughs> there is so much. And I, I really appreciate that because I know far too often there isn't enough space left for the nuance or recognizing someone's full humanity. And it is unfortunate right. that Bayard's name is not mentioned, it's whispered when you think about Baldwin and some of the others that people tend to prop up a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So thank mm -hmm. you for, for talking about that yeah. and, and dropping that gem about being relentless in whatever your pursuit is, especially towards liberation is amazing. Um, but yes. I've kicked us off. I know there are questions here, so please do not be shy. Ask a question. Um, yeah. Looks so, like there's a question for you in the chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, you mentioned trying to make the world a better place for members of the transgender community. Do you have things that you recommend others can do to help achieve that goal? Well, first off, I'll say this, help people get paid. <laughs> that, is the, that is the first way that you can help the trans community, specifically the trans black community, put money in their pocket. And what I mean by that is, is you, if you're not in a place, because again, I, I recognize I like to say gas is high, and I know y'all live in San Francisco, so I know it's even more expensive up there. Um, but I say it this way, right? You may not be able to say, here is $300, go pay your car note, go pay your rent. But what you could do is you could potentially say, hey, I have this thing at work that I'm doing. Can I send you a 1099 and get you on to do something in that right, right? It, 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 it doesn't always have to come out of your pocket. I will say this intentionally. The person who produces my show is a trans Asian person. Um, the person who edits my show is non-binary. My co-host is non-binary. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to purport that, oh, look at me, look at what all of I'm all am I doing. But I will tell you this: that there have been opportunities that people have sent over to me, and I've said, you know what? I it's not even that I don't need the money, because I'm always taking check. But I know that Char Jocel, who is a Black trans woman in the same space that I'm in, could use that $2,500. So have y'all reached out to Char? Because Char is available to, to do that, right? Um, or someone will say, oh, here's you know an opportunity for you to bring in two or three other people. I will intentionally say, uh, I think Ashley Marie should be on that panel because Ashley needs that much. So like th there are ways, but when you think about it, right, it doesn't always have to start with you reaching into your pocket and giving it that help making sure that they have access into rooms. And I will say this, um, you know, again, not tapping myself on the shoulder or on the back for this, but I even think about, you know, my friend, Dominique Morgan, my friend, Dominique Morgan, I brought them in. So the Oprah project had asked me to do something with them. And I brought Dominique Morgan in to do that project with me for the Oprah project. Dominique Morgan turned around and ended up being the ED for the Oprah Project. <laughs> so for a year and a half, right? So it's it's stuff like that. They were able to, to sustain themselves off of a whole job from this panel that I brought them in to do, 
right? That's the kind of stuff I think about. Um, but also too, really thinking about the ways that you uplift them. Are you listening to them when you're in community with them? Are you bringing them into community with you, right? Um, if your entire board is nothing but cishet, you know, queer people, we, we, we've got to have some questions and some conversations about the ways that we're, we're, we're advocating and that we're going up for trans people, right? Um, I have been in rooms where I've asked EDs, how many trans people do you have that work here? And they couldn't tell me. They, 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 they didn't know because that's not something that they are actively thinking about, right? So it's, it's, it's really thinking about, you know, I always like to say, and I've said this in so many different ways, both on and off of social media, I said, I think it's so interesting that so many people have a lot to say about the queer community, but they never had a queer person in their house, right? You don't know enough of us to really know what our issues are. Um, when we ask the question, how do we make the world a better place for trans people? It's not just about protecting them and making sure that they can live, but it's about making sure that we have deeply rooted connections to them and making sure that they feel valued in any and every space that they see you in as well, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Great, great answer, Dr. Paul. Um, and thank you, Mick, for that fantastic question. Anyone yeah, fantastic else? question. Feel free to come off of mute or you can put it in the chat. Feel free to come off of mute or you can put it in the chat. There's, so, I mean, you just hit on so many different things, Dr. Paul, so many gems. I, one of the things, and I, I think I'd love to hear from you. Uh, oh, it looks like we have some, we have two people that are three people. Spencer, I saw your hand first, come on then there. we will Spencer, throw it to Audrey. So Spencer. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. This was so invigorating. Uh, apologies, my camera's not working, but I just wanted to thank you um, for your words and just, you know, for coming into this space. I'm um, a non-binary person, you know, navigating like nonprofits and I'm always learning from other perspectives. And so I just really appreciate you not only discussing the history and the importance, but also just the positives and the media. Um, and I think it's so, there's so much more media content now than like when I was a teenager. And so it's just exciting mm -hmm. to, that we have more material to have these conversations off of. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Yeah, um, you'd be surprised how many people have, you know, I sometimes look at the numbers of my show and what it's doing and I'll go, oh, not enough people are listening. And then I have to sit with and I'll go, you know what? It, it, the people that are listening are supposed to be listening, right? The people that need to be here today need to be here. So everybody, I like to say just thank you all for being here because I think that that, even if you're in a place where you're like, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm being told I got to do something, but I don't know what to do. Being here is that first part of the process, right? It's really just saying, I'm going to carve out an hour of my day to be in community with someone who was thought to be a thought leader. Because baby, let me tell you, sometimes I ain't got all the right thoughts. Um, but being a being in a space with the thought leader, right, who was trying to 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 give us all a chance to think about how do we do this work. That's the first step. So I thank you for being here. Drew, you have your hand up. Audrey, go ahead. If you're talking, you're on mute. <sighs> right. Hi, I actually just stepped into the hallway because um, me and Mick share an office. So if I come off the mic, then the um, audio gets kind of crazy, but, um, I get it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just first wanted to say thank you for all of your thoughts. And then, um, just kind of like giving voice to hearing the idea of using media as like a tool for power, because I know from, for me, I get kind of bogged down at the idea of like all of these companies trying to steal our attention. So to like relook at it with that lens is, um, really helpful, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but what I wanted to ask was, um, yeah, like in your work in, in like fighting against all these systems of injustice and um, everything, how do you sort of like maintain the energy? Because I know something I struggle with is getting into a place of like hopelessness and despondency around it, just the bigness of everything. Um, yeah, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, well, first off, uh, you should have been in my therapy session from 12 to 1. That was the that was the topic of the day was how do I continue to keep doing this work without feeling as if I'm going to burn out? 
Um, <laughs> shout out to Lindsay who holds space for that every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Um, but no, you know, I always like to say something, you know, I, I tend to mask a lot of my uh, stress with laughter. My, my manager's here. She knows that very well about me. Um, in all seriousness, this work is heavy. Um, there are days where I will say, even for me, where I will look around and I'll go, nothing I am doing matters. Why am I doing this? Um, and then I'll get a message from somebody, right? Like, I'll tell you quick, quick thing, quick thing. And then I, cause I know we have another hand. Um, last week I got asked to go speak at a class, um, at Cal State, uh, Dominguez, uh, not Dominguez, where was I, Chad? I was in Northridge. Um, but I had spent the whole day at the, um, I had spent the whole day at the courthouse waiting for the hearing to come down. I don't know any of you are following it, but there is a judge who's basically stepped in and has said that a lot of the stuff that's happening around these policies um, are basically, they're, um, what's the word that he used? They're, they're basically wrong, bottom line, wrong. Um, and so he put the thing in, but I was in San Bernardino. I had to get in my car and drive all the way to Northridge. And as I'm driving over to Northridge, which for those of you who don't know SoCal, with the traffic, it's about an hour and a half drive. So I'm driving to Northridge and I'm thinking, they're only paying me a couple of pennies to be in this class. Why am I doing this? I could be at home resting. I'm tired. I get to the class, do my thing over at CSUN, and I leave. And a student adds me on Instagram and messages me and says, Thank you so much for coming to class tonight. I was literally thinking about dropping out next semester and seeing you has helped me say, I can do this, I can finish, right? No lie, I could show you the message, right? Um, that, that I had to, when I was driving home from CSUN, I had to say, that was, and again, I don't know people's religions, I don't know people, so you could be Buddhist, you could be anything. But for me, I say I'm a universalist. I say that was the universe telling me that what I am doing is making a difference, right? That that one student saw me on that day and said, next semester, I was getting ready to get up out of here <laughs> because this ain't for me. But because I've seen you and I've seen that you're doing everything that I want to do, I now know I can do it, right? And so I think that's the thing that keeps me going. Even on the days where I'm looking at my bank account and I'm going, I could be so much more rich if I was doing X, Y, or Z. Or why am I not getting an award for that? Or why am I not being, you know, allotted in the way that other queer people in this industry are being lauded? I sit back and I just go, you know what? Your journey is your own and you have to hold that. And so I think, you know, to your point, how do I take care of myself? One, allowing myself moments to say, girl, you can be selfish and turn off, right? Um, the world, you don't got, you ain't got to be, you know, Batman every day, honey, right? I know the bad signal is there, but sometimes the bad signal has to wait. Um, <laughs> you know, some nights I look at the TV and I say, I'm going to watch some trash TV tonight and I will get back to the March tomorrow, right? Um, I'm sitting with that now. I have to come up with some stuff for the company I work with and I'm just going, they'll get it when they'll get it because I'm out here doing everything that I can do, right? But I think that the biggest thing for you, and this is something that I'm learning with my therapist, is, is really thinking about how do you center you in this work, right? We've spent our whole lives, a lot of us in this room, because of who we are, Black, queer, all the things of the above, we've spent our whole lives fighting for other people, taking care of other people. You've got to take care of yourself in the process. And so what does that mean for you? Baby, let me tell you, as soon as this button says in, I'm going to get my nails done. That's how I take care of me, right? Um, I'm a run to the coach store, return a bag. Like, I'm just being real, right? Like, there, there are things about my day where I say, I'm gonna give a lot of myself to the world and I'm gonna do the work, but I'm also gonna do the things that make Jonathan feel good too. And that's, that's what we have to do in order to stay. Because again, if we don't do it, it'll burn us out. And then, then white supremacy wins because that's what it's intending to do. It wants to burn us out. It wants to keep us running in circles until we, we, we lose the energy. And so when you can take back some of that energy and say, okay, I'm going to expend it the way I need to expend it, but I'm also going to take care of me in the process. That's how we keep doing the work. The work will be here tomorrow. We times two, Rocio, times two. Somebody going to find something else to add to it. Yes. Um, but yes, that's how I see it. I hope that answered your question, baby. Uh, Lydia. Mm -hmm. Hello. I'm going to echo um, Yvonne's statement about experience with you because I'm feeling it. Um, you're definitely bringing the energy. I appreciate you being here with us today. I really, really do. Um, with that said, I know you've talked about your podcast. Uh, my wife and I have been talking about starting a podcast for like the last couple of years. So I want to kind Sorry. of like your advice of like the do's, the don'ts, your whole experience with it. What would you, what advice would you give someone who's 
who's thinking of like, you know, jumping over and, and, and taking that leap mm-hmm. um, into podcasting. Oh, baby, it has been two and a half years. Um, I will say I got fortunate because I have um, one. Thank you for asking that question, because I know a lot of people seem to be like that. Que- I've, I've had people hit me with I wanted to ask about it, but I didn't know if it was too personal. No, I don't. I'm not. If you know me, you know, I'm going to tell you the ins and outs of everything that needs to be told. So what I will say is one, make sure if you are, if you, so there's two lines that you could go. It's kind of like joining the music industry. This is how I've likened it, right? When you, if you say, oh, I want to be a singer, you have to ask yourself, do you want to be on a label or do you want to be independent, right? Um, And there's a, there's, there's a lot of greatness to both. I've had both. I was independent on a podcast called Learn for two years that fizzled out the person that I was doing the show with said I don't want to do this anymore I kind of was in the lot I don't want to do it anymore with them either um and so my independent podcast fizzled out um and it was very independent it was you know my 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 colleague was editing it my colleague was doing all of the promo for like we were we were doing some stuff together but for the most part it was just very much doing it out of a garage that's the way I likened it cool for the two years that we did I learned a lot about metrics I learned a a lot about posting I learned about social media there are a lot of things that I learned and then when iHeart came around right when they looked at me and they said you have a brand you have a platform you have a voice we love what you stand for we want to buy your show it was like oh snap now I'm on a label so what I had to do was I had to get an entertainment lawyer so the question becomes do you have the money for an entertainment lawyer? Because an entertainment lawyer ain't cheap, um, <laughs> especially if you're gonna put them on a retainer. I'ma just think about it. It was three. It was $3,000 for me to find a good entertainment lawyer. I'm not working with her no more, but I know that that's, that's the price range, right? Um, and then you have to start getting into the legals of what your contracts looks like. My contract with I Heart is great because if I wanna go on another show to promote Black Fat Femme, I can. If I wanna go be on someone else's show as a co-host for a couple of weeks, I can, as long as I'm not getting paid, right? Um, there, there are all of these things that come into it, but you really have to think about what works for you too. You have to think about the timing. I do my show weekly. My show weekly, I can do it because it's technically a full-time job to me. I, I, I have an editor. I have someone who does research for me. I have someone who executive produces it and will go in and come to the recordings and will send out stuff to make sure that we get our guests, right? Like it's, it's, I didn't get T.S. Madison. My, my producer got T.S. Madison. I didn't get Francesca Ramsey. My producer got Francesca Ramsey, right? So like, you just kind of have to ask yourself, like, where is your head? I always would, it, but, but my biggest thing would be how much time do you have to commit to it? There are some people who put their podcasts out in seasons. There are people like me who do it weekly. There are people who, you know, that, that do it once a month. I know Translash uh, Media, their podcast, they put them out, I think it's bi-le- bi-weekly. Um, there are so many different things that you have to think about, but I would say the one thing that I will tell you is people will find your show and will listen to you. Are you okay with, or that, that's the one thing that I have to learn. Are you okay with being known for what you put out? Are you okay with the, the thought that people will start to expect things from you? When our show pops up late, people hit me, where's the show? And I'm like, oh goodness, we were just late a little bit. Come on now, give me some, give me some time. Um, but all that to be said that there's just so many different things to think about, but yeah, I would love to, if you have any questions more about podcasting, my journey to it, I would love to jump online with you. So feel free to send me an email and I'm definitely happy to use my experience as a resource for you. Dr. Paul, you are dropping so many gems. And also if you check in the chat for people that are interested, when you think about intellectual property, John's manager. Uh, Stephanie dropped uh, an amazing, who is waving now, uh, dropped an amazing gem in the chat. We have five minutes remaining for those of you, whether you work at Compass Family Services or you don't, please take a moment to click the link and fill out the post-event survey. Uh, Your feedback will be aggregated and shared with Dr. Paul as they do everything they can to continue trailblazing and setting the world on fire. We have four minutes left. So if someone has one more question, one more question I would love to give you an opportunity to ask. And then Dr. Paul, if you want to go over where people can find you again on social or how they can connect with you, that would be great. But in the four minutes we have remaining, does anybody have one more question? No pressure. And if you don't, that's okay. okay. If you don't, and that's fine too. Um, oh, what's your oh, theme song anthem? That is a good question. You know what? Good um, question. Just I'ma just say it. It's real. Um, mine is Formation by Beyonce. 
it's that last line that she says at the song. Um, oh gosh, I wish I knew. I know the lyrics when I'm singing along to the song, but she says the best revenge is your paper. And I don't even think of it as like money wise revenge is your paper. I always think of that line as being this notion that when other people see you or when other people hear your name, you know, I, I think about this often. Um, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll let you all go. I think for me, the best, I'm going to say it's revenge, but it's just kind of the way that the world works. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Buddha, whoever. Um, <laughs> but um, I had someone hit me from student affairs and said, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in years. And I opened up my Netflix and you were on the front cover of Netflix. And I just was like, the universe, right? Like this notion of how even in, in even on my worst day, you know, there the world is still being reminded that I'm still here, right? That I'm still thriving, that I'm still doing it. Um, and so every time I think about that song and I think about that line, it always just makes me feel good of like, yeah, people, people are gonna know who Dr. John Paul is, regardless of if they want to or not. Um, so that's that. So thank you for asking that question. And go out and listen to Renaissance and watch the visuals when they come out on uh, 1130. If you know me, you know Beyonce is like my beacon. Um, but all that to be said, um, where to find me when I am not in therapy every week <laughs> at 12 p.m. with Lindsay. Um, I'm usually trying to find the best donut somewhere in my, my local vicinity. Or you can find me on social media at Dr. John Paul. Or you can also listen to my show every Tuesday on the iHeart Network, Black Fat Fam. So. Absolutely or locally fantastic. now at a courthouse. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fantastic, Dr. Paul. Thank you. The next time you're in San Francisco, you will have to come visit us here at Compass Family Services. We would Will love to do. give you a tour. So you, you and I will be in correspondence. I know a lot of folks would love to meet you. Again, everyone that's here, thank you all so, so much for joining. The playback will be made available on YouTube in a couple of days. Be sure to follow Compass Family Services on Eventbrite, on Twitter, on Instagram, everywhere on social. So you can look at some of the amazing things that our agency does because we work with amazing people as we serve such an amazing community. I hope that everybody has a fantastic day on purpose. Thank you, everyone.